Ladies and gentlemen, here we bring you the last session of Day 1 Mind Mind Summit 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing our esteemed group of panelists. First and foremost, Mr. Saurabh Srivastava, co-founder and director, Indian Angel Network. We can have a big round of applause, come on. Up next, we have a very young and a very vibrant personality, Mr. Ritesh Agarwal, founder and CEO, Oyo Rooms. Moving on, we have Mr. Vikram Malhotra, Executive Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Credit Suisse. <laughs> Up next, we have Mr. Alan Rosling, Senior Advisor and Operating Partner, Navam Capital. And of course, we have our enigmatic moderator, Mr. Richard Reiki, CEO, KPMG India. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I know we are in the last session, and I've already been given a warning that uh, at 6 o'clock, we are being asked to get into question Q&A with the group. Uh, we have an excellent panel here, and I do not want to take away any more time uh, in uh, terms of what you can get out of this. And um, uh, what we will do out here is that uh, I will ask a few questions to the panelists so that we make it interactive. And after that, uh, we will open it up uh, to, uh, to the audience uh, to ask any Q&A. Because we have Ritesh who's put Oyo rooms. We've got Saurabh Shirvasta who's all his life been, a, been an entrepreneur. And he will have some serious experiences to give. And now he's into angel networking, angel investing. And he can give some experiences. Alan used to work in the corporate world and has now got into entrepreneurship. And of course, Vikram has got his examples out of China and Hong Kong. And I think this is something that we can learn because we have some misconceptions of what happens in other countries. Let's listen uh, from the people who have actually been on the ground and been there. Uh, Ritesh, I would like to start with you being the youngest and uh, being uh, the biggest, I mean, the topic of the day is entrepreneurship and disruption. And you possibly have created some of the greatest disruptions in the industry uh, in which you are there. And you are actually now becoming the go-to guy. So can you uh, kind of share your experiences that when you came in, you know, first of all, what made you get into it? And uh, how do you think the current business in which you are is uh, uh, going to be sustainable and uh, be there? Thanks uh, for the question and thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'd love to share a little bit about myself and, and more about the company. But to begin with, uh, we believe that the market has just begun happening, right? We believe we're not even half a percent of the disruption that we wanted to create. So still have a long way to go. So hi guys, I'm Ritesh. Uh, started OYO a couple of years back. The aspiration always was to change the way how people will stay away from home. A lot of people every year travel by trains, buses, railway transport, airlines, and so on to multiple cities. And 12 times as many people in India stay with relatives to the number of people who stay at hotels, which meant there was a huge problem out there. And we felt we wanted to go out and solve it. Uh, when we started, the first business, so just to give you some background, I grew up in the southern half of Orissa, and as a young kid, did all sorts of things, right? Selling SIM cards, FMCG products. I was not the usual kid who go out there and, you know, uh, play cricket, basketball, and so on and so forth. Post 10th grade came to the northern half of India. This was 2009, 2010, when recession had hit US. A lot of great guys who were educated Indians were coming back to India to set up their own companies. And that was the first time I saw some of these amazing people. And I got so inspired, and, you know, people, uh, the first time I would uh, hear was uh, Sanjeev Saab, who runs Nokri, and a couple of these amazing people where I felt, I want to surround myself with everyone who becomes an entrepreneur because these are the smartest people around myself. So this was a period uh, for two years after that, during my 11th and 12th grade, the good thing about Kota where I went after my 10th grade is you don't need to go to school every day. Uh, so I basically took complete advantage of it and would work for startups for free for a year and a half after it. I was amazed with the kind of impact and learnings you would have as a startup. So I could, I could not but do the startup after that instead of going to college. My family hated me for it. 
but uh, I dropped out of college, never went to one, got paid by Peter Thiel uh, not to go to college. That was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Uh, post that, started Oravel, which was the first thing, right? And the uh, Oravel was almost like a business opportunity, would travel across a lot of northern states in India. And it started almost like a blog because we, I felt that I could introduce people to accommodations that never existed by means of phone numbers. Later that started becoming like a booking site. One thing about, uh, at least with me, what I've seen is entrepreneurs, while they see that the numbers are growing, in your heart of hearts, you know that if something is not working. So I knew it was not working, even though the numbers were growing, right? And the fundamental reason was everyone who booked us used to basically say, hey, but we booked, but we did not get the confirmation. Something went wrong literally every time, right? Which is when we said it's time, and I saw that the best companies in the world were built by entrepreneurs from the personal pain point, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg wanted to connect people. Steve Jobs wanted a great computer that you, and again, I'm talking about very aspirational people, you know, we are not even an inch of that. but. The aspiration was that. So for three and a half months, at that point of time, a joy trip, and looking back, a learning trip I, I led out, which was basically staying in a new bed and breakfast, service department, guest house every day. I used to write emails to people saying, can you let me stay for free? More, like, you know, being in India, very little people let me stay for free. But a lot of people gave me discounts. So uh, these three and a half months were possibly the most amazing times in my life. When I learned that, the bigger problem was predictability, that is knowing I can trust this accommodation, then discoverability, because enough hotels are available to book online. Came back to Gurgaon, first property, which we basically uh, took, run it ourselves. And you know that property did well, and over time we've reached where we are. So today we partner close to five and a half thousand hotels, the largest uh, hotel brand in the country. We book close to a million room nights a month which is again possibly the largest. He asked, how much capital do you guys need? I said 50 lakhs. He said, we can't fund such less amounts. We will have to give you four crores. I was like, no problems. Aati Lakshmi ko mana karta hai? So, so uh, but you know, I mean, of course, over time, uh, it's, it's, it's done very well for them. And I think, uh, you know, I, of course, I look back at that and feel how naive of me. But I feel being naive is also very important in the current environment. Because in general, in the country that we exist, with the kind of problems that we see, literally building any business is impossible, if you were to think of it that way. So at some level, if you're naive, like the time when we, I started a hotel business was a time when nobody would have invested in the hotel business. It was not attractive at all. But it was the naiveness of me which said that, hey, this is a problem that I see, so probably so many other people would be seeing, so let's go do it. It was not conventional wisdom that allowed me to do it. So I think a couple of these things, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm sorry I went through three uh, very different attributes, but try to uh, document as much. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Ritesh. Uh, sort of uh, considering that um, you have seen entrepreneurship, you have seen the ups and downs, you have seen the boom of India, you have seen the downside of it. Are there any kind of um, um, tips or any kind of advice that you'd like to leave for maybe a lot of budding entrepreneurs sitting in this room? as to what are the things they should look out for, or investors, what do they look out when they look at a new project? Well, let me just start by saying, I think this is probably the best time in modern history in India to actually be an entrepreneur. Uh, and there's a Gallup poll that got done recently, which said that India is actually almost number one amongst countries uh, where people should be entrepreneurs. 60% of Indians could be good entrepreneurs, because the three traits which are very good for being an entrepreneur, business thinking, uh, optimism, and persistence. They found 60% of Indians have that. But of course, entrepreneurship of that kind is a very recent phenomena. And part of the reason, of course, is that we didn't have the circumstances for it. If you look back 25 years ago, when we sort of liberalized, uh, if you wanted to build a successful company, it was only based on overseas markets. We were not a big market for anything. So it just restricted us to software services and a few things like that. There was no venture capital. Uh, the, the environment isn't great today, but it was awful at that time to create a company. So it was very hard to do things. The big thing that's changed today, and you just heard Ritesh, is that in India today, most entrepreneurs are building companies that are about domestic markets. And if you look at the US, the biggest success is its 
most of its companies can get most of their business within the US. If you're in any other country, then you have to work a lot harder because it's hard to make a go of it within your country. So I would say to people who are building businesses, hey, this is a great time. Uh, not only is it fashionable uh, now to be called an entrepreneur, but the fact is the system supports you. There, is, there are angel investors, there's venture capital. Uh, last year, to give you an idea, Indian companies raised about $2 billion on public markets. They raised $20 billion, so venture capital and private equity. So it gives you an idea of how things have flipped. You have a lot of mentors, you have a lot of advisors. It's a much more supportive ecosystem. Most importantly, India, as a result of economic growth over the last decade and a half, is actually a good market in many areas. So you can build businesses that disrupt domestic markets. Uh, there are lots of people building businesses around some of the challenges that we have. So what Ritesh said, is he's filling in a void. People needed it. The same thing is happening in many sectors. It's happening in healthcare, affordable medical devices, it's happening in education, all kinds of areas. I would only say, uh, be realistic about what you're trying to do. Capital is available. Don't raise more than you need. You should always raise a bit more than you need, but don't, don't raise much more than you need. Do make sure you have your basic unit economics right. So you may not be profitable, that's not important, but you should know that if you scale this business, you will become profitable. And that's an important one to, to, to remember. Uh, and if I look around at my own experience on businesses that I've invested in, that have worked, that have not worked, must be about 100 by now, the reasons, most reasons why people fail is not because they chose the wrong segment, not because they had the wrong technology, it is because they didn't know how to build teams. They didn't manage cash flow well. They didn't, they underestimated competition. There are, there are a whole lot of reasons which make you fail. And so from the time you start to the time you grow big, you need to only not, not just think about the money that you're gonna raise, uh, not the valuation. Valuation is important, of course. You don't want to dilute any more than you should, but that should not be the key element where you raise money or you don't raise money. You have to have the big picture. And above all, a lot like Ritesh said, and that's a great thing about entrepreneurs today, they all have huge aspirations, big ambitions. So start only when you have an idea which you think will change the world. Don't start because you think you'll make money. You'll make money if you do the right thing, but you won't make money if you start out with that as your main goal. But the problem you're solving should have the ability to be seriously important, seriously large. If you start with a small problem, uh, it's not worth taking the risk of being an entrepreneur. <clears throat> Thank you, Saurabh. I think uh, some really wise words out there saying that you need an idea. It's not about profit, but the business needs to be scalable. The idea needs to be worth taking out. And I think entrepreneurs need to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that finally the, the idea which you have, you can finally make money out of it and it's scalable. I think that's some important words. And the fact that he has seen so many businesses is something there. I think, you know, taking Ritesh's point, you know, here was a very clear case because recently, I know we did a survey from, from some CEOs and we asked him, who are you scared of? Are you scared of your competitor? And they said, no, we are scared of that person who's out there to disrupt the business model. And that's what he did. He actually came and disrupted an existing business model. And today the traditional business is telling him, Okay, give me some ideas. I want to, I just want to stay with you. So let me understand what you're doing and you're going to disrupt me even further. I think this is what we need to worry about because today there is nothing which is known. You know, earlier everybody said, what's the new normal? What's the new? I mean, everything is becoming so pervasive actually into our lives. Technology has gone so pervasive. I think he's used it to its extreme to be able to do what he did. But now I think, let me turn to Vikram who uh, is Indian, as you can see him. 
uh, like he said, born down the street out here, lived most of his life, younger days here, but now lives in China. And let's understand what happens in China on entrepreneurship. And are there any lessons that maybe Indians can take from there? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes, I did. Uh, I was born and raised literally uh, down the road here on SP Mark. Looked a little different in the 1970s, but then I've lived in Hong Kong for the last 20 years and have been going to China uh, pretty much every single month for the last uh, 20 years and have a chance to work with a lot of uh, companies in China that are disrupting, creating. Um, in particular, I've spent probably the last five years of my career um, uh, working with a company called Alibaba, which I'm sure people are familiar with. And, and uh, I used to be responsible for our investment bank, but now I run something called the Entrepreneur Partnership Platform, which is a fund that where we invest in companies, uh, not just in China, but also looking to do in India, uh, that are at a slightly later stage growth, you know, kind of at the same level where uh, Ritesh is in taking this. So uh, it, I think our, you know, our China experience um, that, that I've at least seen has been actually pretty remarkable. Um, China as a country has um, actually been quite ripe for entrepreneurs to thrive. I think uh, the point uh, Saurabh made that this is the last five, 10 years and increasing has been a great time to be an entrepreneur. Uh, today you've got companies uh, that can raise private capital from a much wider variety. I'm, I'm a, historically a banker, so I'll speak a bit more from the financial perspective. But today, entrepreneurs can raise money from much more wide variety of services of, of providers than in the past. You know, 15 years ago, we would always sort of say VCs, and then you have to wait to IPO, go IPO quickly. Now, many companies do actually delay going public because they don't feel it's necessary. They can get institutional money, not just from VCs, private equity, even regular way institutional investors, and now also a lot of crowdfunding. You know, the amount of uh, capital we see that comes from, you know, high net worth and um, even, you know, middle net worth retail. So it's a really good time. Uh, to be an entrepreneur. Now we find companies that go public um, have already got very strong registers of, of shareholders. You know, a company in Alibaba, you know, went public when its value was 170 billion. You know, you wouldn't have heard of that in the past, but then 170 billion comes along, you've been public for, you know, 30 years or something like that. So this, so you're able to raise private capital. Uh, the other thing that really made a difference in China for success has been, um, and I think is the same thing that's happening in India as well. Uh, is the successful companies in China never really copied the uh, a US model. I mean, yes, oftentimes people would look to say, uh, I'm gonna photocopy Google or, or Facebook or things like that. But ultimately, most companies that were created in China were created that was specific to the environment in that country. And I think, um, Ritesh, the kind of stuff you're doing as well is specific to this country. It, you know, that is the most, you know, the clear thing to you, every single time, you know, when um, uh, we would be asked if, in Alibaba, what is this, the Amazon of China? You know, is it the uh, eBay of China? You know, what is it? And we would say, well, actually, it's none of them. You know, it's a bit of Google, it's a bit of eBay, it's a bit of um, um, Amazon, but it's really its own company. And I think every successful company, look at another company there called Tencent. I mean, you know, Tencent started effectively as a messaging company, and then it's really been built its value on gaming, and then it created, you know, an app that I'm sure many people here use called WeChat. You know, so it started from these different things that were specific to that economy in that country. Uh, what's also, I think, been quite important, um, and, you know, people often say, how can the government play a bigger role? I think, you know, obviously government can help in many different ways, but I think the place where China has benefited most, you know, from... Uh, uh, its government's help has been a development of a very robust infrastructure. I mean, most people know that Chinese economy, you know, has been built over the many previous years on investment and exports, and now it's shifting to uh, consumption. That's because many of the consumption things are able to benefit from the logistics that have been created, the infrastructure that's been created. I mean, Alibaba exists today because there is a good logistics network the logistics company can take care of, you know, similarly with other companies. So that is, I think, where, you know, um, in leaders in this country, I think, should push the government is to continue the development acceleration of infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, finally, I think I wanted to comment that um, uh, two things. One is, you know, on the competition point uh, that was raised earlier, 
I mean, if you were to ask, um, you know, Jack Ma of uh, Alibaba, you know, who is your competitor? Who are you afraid of? By the way, in his IPO, he's asked this question every single day. He said, my only competitor is one that I cannot see. You know, he said, you know, he said, are you afraid of Google? Are you afraid of Amazon? None of that stuff. He says, I am afraid of a kid sitting in a garage thinking about how he's going to kill me. Because the reality is, a big company has to cannibalize itself to come and compete with me, and they won't do that. But a kid has nothing to lose. And they will come after me, and I'm really afraid of that. You know, and um, person I cannot see. So I think, you know, as, uh, you know, you know this, this is now much more mainstream, and that's how people in China as well are thinking, not too different from here. And I think it's, a, um, it's fascinating what's going on in these two countries. Thank you, Vikram. Um, I think uh, Jack Ma was scared of Ritesh Agarwal, <laughs> the kid he couldn't see. Uh, anyway, so uh, Alan has got a, a life in corporate. He used to be working with Tata's, then he went and did his own entrepreneurship. Uh, he started a venture and now he's into uh, his own funding organization. And, but more importantly, I think he's writing a book on entrepreneurs, on entrepreneurship. And he's interviewed 66 of them, am I right? Yeah, so uh, he's I'm interviewed to target is to 100. Okay, he's uh, it'll be 68 by the end of the night. <laughs> so he's going to do one interview after this session. Uh, so, uh, so 66. So I think we can learn, we can understand from your journey, Alan, as to what are the things that you have learned in your interviews with these people, and what other things that you may want to share. I mean, I think the first point is sort of point. It's never been a better time in India to be an entrepreneur. It's fantastic, and it's changing the country, and it will change the country more. Second point, I think, is that there's a big difference between the guys who set up businesses 20 years ago, what I think of as the, the children of Man, 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 Man Singh. So I, I saw Mr. Mittal today, for example. I saw Naranamurti on Monday. These guys had a different experience from Ritesh, right? So India is changing very rapidly. Um, and I think part of it around, is obviously around technology and the opportunity and the markets and so on, but it's also much more importantly about culture. India's culture is changing in a way which permits entrepreneurship. So that 20 years ago, when, when I, you know, my prospective mother-in-law heard that I was in business, she fainted. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, you probably are far more marriageable. Your wife, your father-in-law, your father are going to be far more supportive of you than they were before. And that matters in India. So the social trendiness of entrepreneurship, the social acceptability of entrepreneurship, the willingness to try something and fail. Because now, if you fail, you just go to Goldman Sachs and get a job. In the past, of course, if you failed, you would struggle to get a job even with Tata or Mahindra or whoever. So I think it's wonderful, and the funding thing is very important as well, of course. Uh, Saurabh mentioned the you know, 24 billion last year of uh, venture funds available for India, which is a transformation. I would say there are three buts. And this is where I think India has got some more to go. Um, the, the first but is around the government, and it's always very easy for us business people. I built a solar power company, so I deal with the government every day. It's easy for us to blame the government. This government, of course, is trying. They get it, partly. But the reality is it's not around the sort of initiatives that Startup Stand Up India announced. It's around the ease of doing business. It's around infrastructure. It's around the government inspector. It's around tax returns. It's that stuff. The stuff which we entrepreneurs have to deal with and raise the cost, the trouble, the hassle, the difficulty, the delay of being an entrepreneur in India versus China, Malaysia, the UK, or the US. Um, the second area, I think, where we still got a long way is uh, the quality, the depth, and the value add of the venture capital and private equity world. There aren't enough Sorabs. There aren't enough guys with technical experience technical understanding, willingness to take technology risk, uh, willingness to add value to a company. So frankly, too many of our private equity friends are ex McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, super clever, but are, are, may well do a deal correctly and do a valuation correctly, but once they're in, in my experience, they, they don't add enough to the business in the way that guys in the valley do, or guys in Silicon Fen do. So I think the, the, it's not just about the quantum of funding, it's about the quality of funding. The third point is, I think, around us for entrepreneurs. India is a country of, of herds and trends. And at the moment, obviously, um, digital 
is very popular, that's fantastic, because it's, tr it's transforming many industries. But if we are going to develop this country in the way that it can be, should be, we all need to, to employ the young kids, we need entrepreneurship to spread like a virus throughout the whole country. Not just Hawaii and Bangalore, and not just um, digital and healthcare and fintech, but we need entrepreneurship in healthcare, in manufacturing, in engineering, in drug discovery, and these things are more difficult to do. They are longer gestation periods, they're longer lead times, there's more technology risk. So critically, we need entrepreneurs who want to innovate. It's not just around disrupting business models, it's product innovation and innovation in everything you do. And that is really tough to do. So uh, with uh, the depth of technical expertise coming out of our universities, we have the ability. The universities need to change in order to spawn more businesses. Um, but most importantly, the entrepreneurial thinking needs to change. It's not about quick money. It's about long-term value creation. Thank you, Alan. Um, in view of the time running out against us, because we have a 6.15 hard stop, I'd like to throw it open uh, to, the crowd, to the audience for any questions that you may have from the different panel members. Please raise your hand, mention your name. Keep the question short, please, so we can get as many in. Please. Yeah, hi, my name is Vijay. I want to ask one thing that are the investors today ignoring the, uh, you know, what we call as a non-unicorn companies where they have a, they're small, but a established business model where, you know, the PLs and all of them are in control. Uh, maybe the investors are looking at the idea of, you know, uh, they're thrilled with the gamble of that you know, product which gets big valuation, you know, probably two of them will succeed out of 100. But are they ignoring that, uh, you know, what I'm saying? Yeah, so, no, I understand, I understand, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, so I should tell you that's not the case. Certainly, the media has a lot more of the unicorns. It's more sexy, you know, it's a flavor of the day. But I'll just give you my experience from uh, the Indian Angel Network. So we do about... 40 investments a year, so about one every 10 days. We haven't done an e-commerce investment in three years. Where are the investments coming from? A lot of the stuff that you're talking about. In all areas, uh, and very successful, the companies that are around hospitality, the companies around food, not just food tech, but actually about food. Box lunches that you uh, distribute of a certain variety, okay? Wow Momo is a company we funded. There's another one called Box 8, very successful. 25 times your return in two years. You know, it's the sort of thing you would expect from, from internet companies. Manufacturing, automatic dosa makers, affordable healthcare devices, semiconductors, uh, education. So, whole variety whole variety of companies. So the, the good thing in India today, which is what I was saying in the beginning, is you look around, we are a huge market today for many things. Uh, it's very disaggregated in India. It's not very organized. It used to be a pain point, but actually it's a huge opportunity. And there are lots of people coming into it. They are getting funded. Uh, they're all, they all have business models which uh, are based on good unit economics. So whether or not they make profits today, you know that as a scale, they will actually make profits. So I think there isn't a dearth of that. It's, uh, I mean, there are 5,000 entrepreneurs that we see every year. It's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great scenario. I mean, I just look back to uh, when I first became an entrepreneur, I too was running a Tata company at that time, Tata Unisys. Uh, we're talking of 89. The whole IT industry was $15 million. So when I did my startup, what was my ambition? 10 years time, I'll get to $15 million. Because that was a whole industry. No entrepreneur comes to me today with an ambition of doing $50 million in 10 years. So it's changed. It's completely changed. And it's, it's, uh, it's happening across the board. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Nixon. I work for Traxon, so Traxon is a research and field sourcing uh, discovery for startups. We serve the investment 
community like GC firm. Your Gates. question? Uh, my question is, how can you promote uh, entrepreneurship and skill development in rural India? Rural India. Rural India. Well, that's what the government is trying to do. If you look at this budget, they have a whole amount of money allocated to doing precisely that, to doing skilling, to doing education, a whole lot of stuff over there. Uh, it's quite key to doing that. In fact, I was involved in some discussions on that issue. Uh, because you want 50% of the country is in the rural areas, depends on farming but farming is just 14% of our GDP. So you have to have people in rural areas doing other than farming. So it's happening, it's slow, but government is trying to do what it can, I think. Yes, okay, sure, Alan, please. Yeah, I mean, to answer next night, to my, my take on your question, rural India, is the, the government cannot promote entrepreneurship in a village, but they can build a road. It can give them power. It can, you know, and make the police work. And if those things are there, I mean, already 50% of rural population is, is non-agricultural. These guys are entrepreneurs already. And with this infrastructure and with this good governance, entrepreneurship will explode in rural India. <clears throat> That's what happened in China. Alibaba was created in a place called Hangzhou. No one had heard of it, not in Beijing. Okay, uh, this is the last question we have got. Uh, sorry, we're okay. running out of time. Yes. On a lighter note to Vikram, uh, Vikram, I order from AliExpress and it takes 40 days. Can you reduce the time it comes uh, for delivery of stuff to India? I'll call Jack right away. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, do we have time for one more question? Okay, sir, one more? Okay. Put his hand up, yeah. I am Saket. Can you, can you, can you please keep the mic closer? Yeah, I am Saket. Yeah, yeah, Saket. Yeah, my question is that nowadays we see a culture of uh, VCs uh, at its peak, and people are, uh, there are a lot of companies, they are trying to manipulate in terms of their overall value analysis uh, when it comes to. Uh, Can you speak a little closer the to the mic? When it comes to getting the funds, and it's creating a bad impact for the new entrepreneurs to get the VCs. Think about the business as, as a whole. Can you repeat your question a little? Michael, is it closer to your mouth? Yeah, my question is there are so there are a lot of uh, small companies or new entrepreneurs, they are trying to create a kind of a value sheet which is not a kind of an achievable target. So just to look, uh, just to get the VCs in, this is a kind of a fear which we see as, as a small company right now that is pertaining in India. Is it going to hamper the overall no. process? Yeah, but you know, this is every single entrepreneur always exaggerates. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes because they have no idea, they're into an entirely new business, entirely new model, and nobody in the world knows what it's going to be. So it's a very stupid investor that invests in looking at those projections. Because the reality is if it's a new idea, it's a new business model, the poor, un the poor entrepreneur actually doesn't really know what it, where it'll be five years from now. Uh, I certainly can't look at a business that hasn't even started and say, let me do discounted cash flow from five years from now. So you have to try and understand the business. You have to take a calculated risk. Uh, so I think there's nothing wrong with people trying to exaggerate. That may be the best they can do, is for the investors to spend the time and effort to, to understand whether this is real, not real, what is realistic. That's okay. I don't think investors or VCs get put off by uh, entrepreneurs giving them uh, unrealistic numbers. It, believe you me, that happens nine times out of 10. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I have a rather simple question. Can you can't hear me? A little. So uh, everybody on the panel pretty much said, you know, this is the time for entrepreneurship in India. I just want to uh, optimistically, you know, in, uh, 
it is a time, but in what sense are you saying it? Like, do you mean infrastructure is a lot better than it was, or that the public is more uh, receptive, uh, there's more of a customer base uh, who will sort of be more accepting of a new idea, or, uh, I mean, in what sense do you mean this is the time for it to happen? I, I would say all of the above. All of the above. Because, if I was a see, see, what do you have today? Uh, if you have a new idea, you want to be an entrepreneur, it's acceptable today to be an entrepreneur because you can, there's funding available. Angel funding, VC funding, next round funding, all of that is available. You have mentors. You have people who've been successful entrepreneurs who are actually willing to come help you and mentor you. When we were setting up some time ago, there was nobody who had done it before. So there was nobody who could come and tell you what to do. And when I wanted to do my first startup, my family said, you must be mad. My wife said, listen, don't ever tell me you did it for me. There was not a single person on the planet who said it's a good idea. Today is very different. You can set up a business in India today, targeted at the Indian market. And you can scale and be successful purely on the Indian market. That was not available earlier on. The Indian brand, if you're going overseas, is a good brand today for entrepreneurs, for technology. 25 years ago when we were doing our business, India was a third-rate brand abroad for products. We were supposed to be a loser country. You ask me, you know, I, I can't, if I compare to now, to 10 years ago, five years ago, even last year, there's a great time to do it. And it's a great time because it's just starting out. Ten years from now, competition, if you think it's bad now, will be horrendous. I've because raised money for companies, you know, in China, in, in India, everywhere. I mean, the three countries where you can raise money for entrepreneurial ventures the most easily are US, China, and India. You know, try raising it in Malaysia, real struggle. Try raising it in, in um, other smaller countries, real struggle, because the scale, as Saurabh says, of these three markets, people can believe it. You don't need to have to take it to other countries. You can scale it right here. So to be an entrepreneur in these three countries today is just wonderful. Well, today you can do a startup venture, and you can get Sunil to invest in it as an angel. I have a question, sir. Wouldn't have happened <laughs> five Army, years ago. My, I'm Baba Steve from United States, of course, but I lived here. Anyhow, I just recently visited, and I have just released a book for Trump has had my book and Hillary Clinton has my book. Anyhow, I want to market it here because it is prescription for conditioned unconsciousness because I love the India and you people are great. And this is a great meeting, mind, mind. And you, can you guide me what I need to do because I hear so many people come and talk to me and they give me different answers and I'm completely confused. So would you kindly help me? Me. Yeah, we can do that offline now because I'm sorry, we just run out of time completely um, and uh, so we'll have to close it. I would like to thank my panel members for the insights you've got and I hope you got some really good tips on entrepreneurship from them. Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for all our esteemed panelists? I'm sorry, my voice was a little louder. I would request uh, a renowned industrialist, Mr. Atul Raheja, to kindly grace the stage and present uh, mementos to our esteemed and brilliant panelists. First and foremost, Mr. Saurabh Srivastava. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. Saurabh? <laughs> Up next, Mr. Ritesh Agarwal. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a very successful day one of Mind Mind Summit 2016. We can do with a much bigger round of applause. Come on. Up next, Mr. Vikram Malhotra. Moving on to Mr. Alan Rosling. And of course, the talented Mr. Richard Reiki.
would request all gentlemen to kindly come together for a group photograph. Thank you, gentlemen. Can we have a round of applause for the last session of the day?